This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. In our previous session together last time, we made mention of the idea of the style of question that has now been brought into the taxation paper, attempting to, as this note here says, bridge the gap between the taxation, the UK taxation paper, and the advanced taxation paper, bringing more planning style. Now, what does tax planning mean? It means, of course, we're trying to mitigate the tax burden of a taxpayer here in individual or individuals in corporate tax, obviously the corporation tax liabilities of companies. We're trying to mitigate that tax liability. We're trying to reduce that tax liability. Of course, we'll be doing it in a legal way. Again, if you've read anything out of chapter one as yet, which you may not, what we're able to do in terms of tax avoidance is to arrange our taxation affairs as taxpayers in a way as to mitigate our tax liabilities. What we cannot do is to move over the fence from tax avoidance to tax evasion. Evasion is evil indeed there, where we're deliberately doing something that is not allowed to avoid paying tax. For example, not disclosing information about a source of income that we have or making a statement that we've incurred expenditure that we have not. That is tax evasion. That you can't do. But basic tax avoidance is permitted in terms of arranging your taxation affairs in such a way as to reduce your overall taxation liability. And we saw that in the previous session when dealing with spouses or civil partners, specifically in relation to income producing assets. The heading that we saw was joint income that arose from a jointly owned asset, where we saw what the rules were. The rules were and are that if you have civil partners or married couples having joint ownership of an income producing asset, then in terms of how do we deal with each spouse's or civil partner's income tax computations, it was very simple. We applied the basic 50-50 rule and we just split that income equally between them. There was an election, of course, to change it from the 50-50 to a basis of the actual ownership. Now that, of course, must be information provided to you. Is it actually own, owned between the two spouses other than 50-50? 60-40, 75-25, 80-20, whatever it might be, that split. So an election was available to move to an actual ownership. But we went further than just looking at, do we have a jointly owned asset? Should we therefore make that declaration, that claim, that election to move to an actual ownership basis of splitting the income rather than just on a simple 50-50 basis? We also saw, what about if one of the spouses or civil partners actually owns the asset outright? Typically a property there, as we saw in the example that we finished the last session with. And that income going to that taxpayer, certainly in any exam question anyway, is inevitably something like a higher rate taxpayer. And the spouse is not a higher rate taxpayer. They may not even be a taxpayer. In that example of Elton and David, we saw that Elton was a higher rate taxpayer and David had no income at all. Therefore, a completely unused personal allowance. Therefore, it was an obvious thing to do. What we could do, move the entire ownership of the asset from the one spouse or civil partner to the other, taking income out of either higher rate or basic rate and moving it down to either basic rate or no taxation at all, because the individual was not in fact a taxpayer like David in that previous example. And that could save significant amounts of tax, as we witnessed in the calculations that we did. So we've got our first taste, therefore, of action that could be taken of a tax planning nature to mitigate the tax liability of spouses of married couples. And from last time to this, I've asked you to do a little bit of reading out of chapter 26, where we get an introduction to and a discussion of and examples on these tax planning style questions. Now there's various different areas. And again, we are not able to, for example, start to talk about these 
multi-tax questions at this point in time, though I've made brief reference to the capital taxes, and I'll remind you of that again in a moment. We are only at the moment looking at our first chapter in terms of one tax, income tax. So very difficult to look at this stage in our studies at a multi-tax problem. But I did introduce into the idea of moving ownership of an asset in for or in part from one spouse to another, that when you move an asset from one taxpayer to another, you do have to consider other taxes. Those two taxes being the capital taxes, capital gains tax and inheritance tax. And as we said then, as, and as we see in these notes indeed made here, what we have when we move assets between spouses is in fact no difficulties, no problems arise as regards the capital taxes. Because we said that for capital gains tax purposes, it would be dealt with as a no gain, no loss transfer. So no gain arising on the transfer or spouse. Basically, it transfers at the cost of the transfer or becoming the cost then to the transferee. It transfers at cost rather than at market value. We also then said that there'll be no IHT problems. Why? Because transfers between spouses or civil partners are exempt. So that was a multi-tax problem. In order to achieve a saving in income tax, we couldn't ignore all other taxes. We had to consider the prospect of would there be other tax issues. Now there are other tax issues, the capital taxes, but neither of those capital taxes present a taxation problem because neither capital gains tax nor IHT liabilities would arise as a result of the transfer. So we had to consider multi-tax there. Now, once you have gone through all of your studies here, this is why chapter 26 is the last chapter dealing with tax planning. Once you've gone through all of the taxes and you have a thorough understanding of each of the taxes, then many more of the scenarios that are mentioned within this chapter may be dealt with. But at this point in time, we are looking at one particular area. It is, of course, this area of married couples or civil partners. Now, the note above this that introduces this, it says, uh, the introduction of both savings income and dividend income nil rate bands has made the question over the transferability of income producing assets from one spouse or indeed civil partner to another a more interesting problem as compared to the main issue before this introduction of what we saw in the previous uh, lecture simply moving those income producing assets from a higher rate taxpayer to a basic rate taxpayer or even from higher or basic to a spouse or civil partner who has not fully used their personal allowance. Again, that example 16 that we did at the end of the previous session. What we may see now, and that is what is picked up in this particular section here, is that it might, and it sounds counterintuitive this, we might be able to save tax by moving certain income producing assets from the lower tax paying spouse to the higher tax rate paying spouse, which sounds odd. Why would you move a source of income that at the moment may be being taxed at 20% to the other taxpayer spouse, where we think as a higher rate taxpayer, it would be taxed at 40%. But of course, if we think about savings income, if we think about dividend income, we've had the introduction of savings income and dividend income nil rate bands. And what that means is, though yes, the one spouse is a higher rate taxpayer, they'll only be that after they have utilised their nil rate band. So if we could move income to the higher rate tax paying spouse, but who won't pay that because of their nil rate band, currently unused, then that is a sensible idea and will achieve a tax saving. And that's what you read about, I hope you read about, between last session and this one here. OK, let's just again review through what we've got there for in these notes. Now, it refers back to the section, in fact, it's section seven of chapter two, not section six. Again, 
hopefully by the time that you're looking at this, that's been updated anyway. Dealing with income producing assets owned jointly by spouse or civil partners will illustrate the tax advantage to be gained from transferring that ownership again, such as a income producing a rental property from a higher rate taxpayer to a basic rate taxpayer spouse. Again, even greater savings when the transferee spouse was not even a basic rate taxpayer, as with the David and Elton example with the uh, unused personal allowance. This would allow income that would have been taxed at 40% to now be taxed at 20 or indeed not taxed at all. We've said this now many times in terms of the notes we've seen. The transferor spouse could transfer the entire ownership of the asset to the transferee spouse, such that all future income would be taxed in the computation of the transferee spouse. And in most circumstances, so the ones that we've seen anyway, that would achieve the highest taxation advantage moving from 40% to 20 or 40% to 0%. But possibly there is a degree of reluctance on the uh, part of the current owner of that income producing asset, as it may be of very significant value, such as a property from which the rental income derives, to actually lose the entire ownership. So what we might do is to put it into joint ownership. Could transfer therefore any part interest in the asset to make it jointly owned and then you'd move to your 50-50 rule on joint income. So although you wouldn't be moving all the income across and achieving greater tax savings, it would at least achieve some tax savings on half of that income. We make the point here about the capital taxes, though being an issue, not a problem. Again, Mark scored in terms of a written question and making those statements. What we're not yet able to uh, deal with, though again, we may have mentioned it last time, is when dealing with capital gains tax, again, it's a concept, but we, do, we have no detailed knowledge at all at this point, that what you might do is to move an asset across from one spouse to another, not to provide a, a lower income tax rate on future income from that asset, but as a prelude to a sale of that asset whereby by the transferee spouse selling to the outside world, a lower CGT liability would arise than if the existing owner of that asset were to sell. We could change it from maybe a CGT rate of 20% to 10%, or maybe 20% down to 0%, because like we have a personal allowance in income tax, a level of tax-free income, so too do we have an annual exempt amount in CGT. Again, a level of tax-free gains. But we'll see more about that, of course, when we look at Chapter 12. But as we've said, the introduction of these new rate bands for savings income and dividends income has now created opportunities for further tax saving, though we will see with these examples, it's not a very significant tax saving. We're not in the realm of thousands or several hundred. We're in the realms of just a few hundred here. Now, every little helps, and although it may not be a huge amount, it's the principles that, of course, concern us when it comes to dealing with examination questions. And as the examiners have written themselves about these issues, it's important that we take that on board, for it may form the basis of an examination question. So the idea, therefore, opportunities to reduce overall charges to income tax may give an advantage to transferring such income from a basic rate taxpayer spouse to a higher tax rate paying spouse. We've got our example here, Donald and Teresa. Now, uh, if we look at that, we can see that Donald, with his salary of 60,000, is a higher rate tax paying spouse. Teresa has multiple sources of income, salary, interest and dividends. You put that together, 18 plus 2 plus 9, we're only a basic rate taxpayer. And those points are made there, deriving what would be their figures of taxable income. In this situation, it would normally be the case for tax planning purposes, like we've seen in all the examples we've done in the previous session, that it would be advisable to see if any investment income could be moved from the higher rate taxpayer to the basic rate taxpayer, moving from 40 to 20%. This, however, can't happen in this particular example because the only income that Donald has is his salary 
You can't pretend that that is actually Theresa's salary. It is. So that's staying put. But the introduction of the nil rate bans on interest income and on dividend income there. Now, what we can see is that she is a basic rate taxpayer and has £2,000 worth of income, interest income. But she has £1,000 of savings income nil rate bound. That means 1,000 of the 2,000 is not taxed at all in terms of any tax to pay. But the other £1,000 is in basic rate and would be taxed at 20%. And it's suggested here in the notes that, uh, again, I trust you've already read. But what we could do, of course, is to move certain amounts of the interest income producing asset across to Donald, but only so much as would generate sufficient to be able to utilise his savings income nil rate band. Now he is a higher rate taxpayer. He therefore would benefit from just £500 worth of savings income nil rate band. But if we were to move out of that £2,500 over to him, then that's 500 that would have been taxed at 20% in Theresa's hands, now to be taxed at nil rate. It's not a huge saving, I said the numbers would not be that great, and it would be a saving of £100 in tax there. It's the principles that are at stake. Well, what's at stake for you is scoring marks when this particular issue is tested in the examination. Again, it's not going to be a huge practical issue, but it has been stated, discussed by the examiner. It needs, therefore, to be known by you. We've got also the dividends in here, 9,000. Now, what we know is, as a basic rate taxpayer, or indeed any level of taxpayer, there's a dividend income nil rate band, so that 2,000 is at nil. But that still leaves 7,000 in the basic rate band being taxed at 7.5%, the issue that we pick up here. Now then, uh, practically difficult to achieve this because you never know what dividends are going to be paid out on shares. But if you could move sufficient shares from Theresa to Donald in order to generate £2,000 worth of dividend income, so you'd be removing 2000 of that 7,000 taxable income there on Theresa. Put that 2,000 up to him, and that would be at nil. Now again, we're not setting the world alight. Moving £2,000 income from a basic rate taxpayer, where we would suffer only 7.5, to the higher rate taxpayer, who has not yet enjoyed the use of their dividend income nil rate band, but where it'll only be 2,000 at nil. 2,000 at 7.5% is therefore the saving, and that's what's mentioned there. Again, practical difficulties, but you're living in an examination world rather than the real world there, and that's why you need to know it. But we make the point that we made in the previous lecture, and that would be, well, what about, more interestingly, if Donald, in addition to his salary, had some property income? currently being taxed at the 40% rate, as he's a higher rate taxpayer, but we could move some of that across, indeed possibly all of that, across to Theresa, because she's got a significant amount of unused basic rate bands still available. And those are the points that we are fully familiar with. Again, we've made the point about the advantages to be achieved. Just a few final comments there about other issues pertaining to uh, rather more retirement. That is something we'll be able to discuss rather more effectively after you've dealt with uh, Chapter 10 on pensions there. Last point for me to make before we finish off here is that when we return to our notes, you'll see that the next two sections that uh, remain within this chapter are the child benefit income tax charge, and then looking at the resident status of a taxpayer, whether they are indeed UK resident or non-UK resident. Now then, the rules 
have not changed here between last year's 2017-18 tax year and this year's 2018-19 tax year. Therefore, to allow you to access this material more quickly, what uh, you will see in the next lecture, the final lecture indeed on this particularly long chapter, is the lectures from last year. The only difference is in relation to them is that we are this year talking about the 1819 tax year, whereas in last year's notes and last year's examples, it was just the 1718. All that's happened is we've moved the dates forward a year. But the principles, the uh, statements made, the limited calculations that we do haven't changed at all. So on that basis, you're able to use those notes. So I wish you well in terms of finishing off this particular chapter. And again, you'll then note that having uh, completed your work on this particular chapter, in terms of the issues that uh, I've taken you through there, there's reference to other material that you should be using to read, to work, to practice on there before moving on to uh, further issues. I'll be again, well, a year ago, as it were, with you next session to discuss those two remaining areas in this chapter. And then I'll be back in rather more uh, current time to deal with chapter three with you, where we look in more detail at the content of property income and investment income for individuals.